continue the session of today about political graphics. We have already questions that will, I think, uh, circulate in the air all along these two days. And so right now we will approach another medium, the, the journal and illustration. And so uh, with this uh, conference, uh, Visual as Resistance Images of Transnational Student Solidarities in Cold War Uruguay. And so Megan, thank you for being here. Megan Strong holds a PhD in history and MA in Latin American Studies from the University of California. Everything is there. All the radical po people are coming from yeah, there. I, know. I don't know. <laughs> the topics are from there. <laughs> <laughs> and so she works on transnational activism. And she will be uh, presenting us several cases. Um, this is really queer. This follows the thing. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so in Uruguay and the relation with the United States, not the this is the country to which everybody was quarreling about. And so um, you have the floor. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Um, and it was really exciting, as somebody who's from Oakland, California, to see Black Panther Party and lots of other California references up there. Um, so thank you very much uh, for holding this conference, for all of your work. Um, I'm sorry that. Fabiola's not here because I actually met her at LASA last year. And that's how I found out about the conference. Um, but wish you well, Fabiola, in the internet. Um, uh, and also thank you to all the work of the organizers and everyone for being here and for hosting um, during the Women's World Cup. I very much appreciate that as a soccer fan. Ah, so um, anyone who's interested in watching the games, find me at night. Um, of course, outside of the panel times, with all respect. Um, okay, so uh, the paper that I'm going to present today um, looks at work uh, productions from the Federation of Uruguayan University Students, the FEU, who I'll refer to as the FEU for simplicity's, simplicity's sake for the rest of the panel. Um, and I look at the ways that they strategically used images to build transnational solidarities in their organizational newspaper, Jornada. Um, I focus on a few select photographs and political cartoons from the 1950s and the early 1960s that were reproduced alongside articles calling for transnational politics and solidarity. Um, and I argue that these visuals simultaneously reiterate and expand upon the text and the accompanying articles and point to some of the, both the local and the international tensions of the early Cold War period. Essentially, I argue that the images and the articles here work together to help demonstrate the Feyu's political stance um, and their interest as students in being part of a wider public discourse, um, and also as a sort of constant reminder as a student publication meant uh, primarily for students, but also for wider circulation, that students were not limited to weighing in on so-called student issues, um, which was uh, um, sort of a large belief in the day and continues, I would argue, to this day, right, that there's a lot of tension over what students have authority to weigh in on. Um, and as I show here and argue here that political cartoons and photographs uh, were used, the FEU used these to help communicate messages about international politics and transnational solidarity as they related both to uh, current events and to the FEU's own political and ideological platform as a student organization. So the first image uh, I start with, thank you, um, is from an edition in August 1952. Um, and it carries this title in quotes to sort of indicate some sarcasm here, um, Ayuda Reciproca, Reciprocal Help. Um, and this, uh, this image produced in Jornada, I argue, makes a very clear stance on international politics. So I'm just going to describe a little bit the, the scene here before you. Um, and it's featured on the front page. I'll show you a full image of that in a second. But it speaks volumes even just by itself, right? You see a caricature of a towering Uncle Sam figure that's meant to represent the United States, complete with this stars and stripes top hat. Um, but behind his back, he's shown uh, holding a large pair of shackles, while with his other hand extended, shaking the hand of a very, very tiny Uruguayan general um, who is sort of uh, representing his country with the placard underneath his arm that reads Uruguay. Um, but he can only, as you can see, reach this hand of this towering Uncle Sam figure by standing on the backs or the tops of other Uruguayan generals and two cows, which is very uh, appropriate for Uruguay. It's a very large population of cows. 
Um, so it's not an accidental <laughs> reference there. Um, and they're all sort of straining under the weight, right? And then on the side, you see sort of two seemingly low-level military men who seem rather disconnected from the scene before them. One is reclining, smoking a cigarette, looking quite tranquil and oblivious. Uh, the other seems to be preoccupied with an object in his hands. And the argument here, right, I think there's a lot of symbolism here that could stand on its own, but in combination with this, this caption or this title and with the article text that accompanies it, I argue that this image is used to evoke um, really an emotional response, as one of you uh, commented already this morning. I think that that's a lot of uh, what we'll be looking at, and I don't name it as such here, but it's a good reminder, right, to think about um, what is the purpose of why they're using these visuals and how they're using it to communicate a message in a way that, especially in these newspapers, um, has, I would argue, sort of an added impact to the text that accompanies it. So before sort of digging into the comparison with the text, I want to just walk through really quickly the sort of a very brief context of the student organization and the university uh, that it represents and give you a, a little brief sort of setup of their platform so that you can get a sense of where this fits into their larger politics. Um, so the University of the Republic in Montevideo, Uruguay, was founded in 1849 as a public university with free attendance. It remained the country's only university until 1984, following the dictatorship. Um, and now there are sort of various private universities, but it still remains the largest, uh, with about 90,000 uh, folks in attendance, um, and still remains more or less free to attend. Um, <clears throat> so, and that makes it easy for research purposes, right? I only have one university, though it's split up in different parts of the city. Um, the FEU, the Federation of Uruguayan University Students, was founded in 1929 um, and was really an expansion of a student organization from 1908 started by medical and law students. And their mission, the sort of founding ideals of the organization were to help improve the university and improve society at large, right? So they were very committed to this idea of la misión social, something that I take up in other parts of my work um, that are looking at having the university sort of serve a larger function in society, that they weren't interested in just sort of becoming individual or collective um, knowledge bearers, that they wanted their knowledge and the, the spirit of the university to have a social function, right? And so they pushed for connections with, um, with local citizens and, um, and workers and, again, other themes that I look at in other parts of my work, but that gives you sort of a sense that they were as an organization very committed to sort of having a self-reflective and outward looking lens, right? That they're interested in their position as university students, but also in how it relates um, to those around them, both in their country's borders and beyond. And so essentially to sum up, um, the FEU platform from the 1930s to the 1960s actually remained fairly consistent. There's a few uh, changes. That's also something I look at in my larger work is the ability on this organization to maintain this uh, very similar ideological platform over the course of many decades and many generations of students, which is something that uh, is often difficult to maintain for student groups that change, right, every sort of five, six, seven years. Um, but generally speaking, sort of the beginning in the 1930s, as I talk about in the paper, um, they really became active and, and vocally outspoken in the late 1930s with an anti-dictatorship campaign after they themselves faced uh, a period of dictatorship in Uruguay under Gabriel Terra. Um, although it is still then and now uh, has been referred to sort of as a soft dictatorship, as a dicta blanda instead of a dictadura. Um, but they still faced repression um, and censorship, and so the students emerging from that, right, recently founded this organization in 1929, and then very early in the 1930s are sort of faced with their first conflict with the state. And so they emerged from that, and in the transition back to democracy in the 1940s, really take to task both the Uruguayan government and this idea of thinking about who else is suffering under dictatorship and repression and authoritarian rule, and made that a really key component of their domestic and international platform. So that's where 
you have this sort of collection of anti-dictatorship, anti-authoritarian, and anti-imperialism platform. Um, during this and, and sort of through this experience, they developed and became um, advocates for building transnational solidarity, um, both with other students, their sort of uh, transnational peers, so to speak, but also with workers and general citizens um, around the world. In the 1950s, they're really marked by the Tesarismo movement, which sort of to summarize very quickly, um, was essentially a, a post-World War II movement looking at um, sort of combating the Cold War binaries of capitalism and communism, um, something that they had spoken out against in during World War II. They were unwilling to take a position in support of either side. There was a lot of pressure to support the Allied forces and issue a, a public declaration. They actually got into an argument with um, other Latin American student organizations at a conference they had in 1944, uh, where they stormed out and refused to sort of sign on to supporting the Allied forces. And their argument was not that they wanted the Axis to win. They to sort of the short version is that they wanted the Axis forces to lose because they were fascists and evil and all of these things, but they didn't want the Allied forces to win because they were concerned about what that might do to their sort of growing power and imperialism around the world. So what we see in the 1950s, um, in many ways, uh, lining up with movements of the broader Uruguayan left, is this development of a, the idea of tesarismo, which is really a philosophy and ideology that's pushing for a third way, a third option, something that um, it's the idea that there must be something else, right? And so, of course, the major critique of the tesarismo movement um, is that it didn't actually offer a plan for what that third way was. Um, but, you know, in my defense of the students and the Uruguayan left at the time, like, you have to ask the question first before the thing can become a reality. Um, but it certainly was fraught with um, sort of weaknesses that there was an argument that it was really about what they were against as opposed to what they were for. Um, but I would argue that the FEU worked really diligently to try to make connections in terms of who it's who it was trying to support um, through who they were also trying to resist. Um, so that's sort of a, a little brief background on the Feiyu that helps contextualize in many ways the images that I'm going to talk about today. So to go back right to this image from 1952. Um, so this is the moment, right? This is two years after they make their declaration of Tesarismo. And this sort of caption here, um, in many ways, what begins, to, what happens in the, in the 1940s and into the 50s um, in terms of US-Latin American relations only confirms their, the fears that they had during World War II about the growth of US imperialism um, around the world, but especially in Latin America. Um, and so this particular caption is referencing sort of US-Latin America relations in general, but it's also sort of hearkening back to uh, this secret deal that was brokered in 1940 between the U.S. and Uruguayan governments for the U.S. to build military bases on Uruguayan soil, which is happening in other parts of Latin America. Um, and when the news came to light, um, the students and um, the Uruguayan public uh, in general were opposed and appalled, right? And so part of this image is, is sort of hearkening back to that history, but also this idea of um, the good neighbor policy, all of these things that the US claim to be offering as help, um, that this image is helping sort of remind us and remind students that this is not really a uh, reciprocal relationship as much as it's being um, suggested. And so when we look at this in context, right, and this is the, whole, the front page of the, of the newspaper, um, it's featured here in 1952 with a full page article on our third position, right? And, and at the top of the, the sort of headline that runs at the top of the page is against the military treaty, right? So it's also talking about other um, uh, efforts, right, to bring Uruguay and the United States together militarily. And it, the, the FEU here take this as an opportunity to say, okay, let, me, let us clarify. Here's what we mean by our third position, um, and here are all the ways that, um, that we find this 
third position to be urgent, right? And um, especially in relationship to the United States that we need to have another option besides following this sort of capitalist, individualist, consumerist, consumerist um, program. <laughs> And that also, at the same time, they weren't looking to communism for that, right? That they were looking for a third option that would better serve the needs of the world's population. Now, as I mentioned, this is not the first time, right? 1950 is their first official declaration of tesarismo. Um, and it generally lasts about 10 years. Um, Cuba is, as I'll talk about in a second, becomes sort of the dream, very briefly, of tesarismo come to life, and then that goes away. Um, as the dream, but they continue to support Cuba in many ways. Um, but this is the sort of initial um, declaration, and you can see here there's no image. There's also um, other articles about other local issues uh, refer in regards to the FEU and their other sort of domestic platforms. Um, and this article also contains sort of, it's a lot more vague language. It doesn't really explicitly um, sort of name uh, U.S. Latin America relations in, in quite as much detail, um, in contrast to two years later, right, where they sort of take the opportunity to have a front page, sort of essentially taking out a, a front page ad for themselves for the on the cover of their their newspaper, and bringing along this image, right. And so the argument that that I'm making here is that this image is is helping to better communicate um, and accompany this text and really to clarify. Um, some of the foregrounding of their platform in a way that we don't see, you don't have quite the same effect and you don't have quite the same emotional response, right, um, as you do to this 1950 um, full text page. Um, so what's really interesting, and this is, of course, um, images began to be more regularly used by the Feu in the 1950s and 60s, corresponding with the rise in uh, technology of photography, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but this image, the same image, repeats almost 10 years later, eight years later in, in March of 1960, but this time runs with a different uh, caption and different title, right? So it says at the top, respectfully, at the obelisk, um, and then at the bottom, dear Sam, because uh, they're on a first name basis with Uncle Sam, um, my authority emanates from you, dot, 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 and the International Monetary Fund, uh, she ceases in your sovereign presence. And then in parentheses, an authentic transcript of the commemorative medal, which is, of course, here also a sarcastic uh, critique of this idea of US-Uruguayan relations ever being sort of on an equal footing. And the context here for the obelisk is uh, a monument in Montevideo from that was established in 1930 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Constitution. Um, and you can see here, it's a little difficult to see, but there's two small figures right at the very base. And so this is what this image is meant to invoke, right? Is that you're talking about students who live in this city and everyone is very aware of this prominent monument that this is, Uncle Sam is being represented here as this obelisk, this towering figure. Um, and the, the people of Uruguay are featured as these sort of small people. Um, and just a little bit on the context, it, it carries with it a lot of national significance. Um, it runs, it's at the intersection of the Asilo de Julio, which is uh, the day the Constitution was signed. It's a main thoroughfare in the city that crosses uh, Boulevard uh, Artigas, who is uh, considered the, the, the father of Uruguay. Um, and it's at the sort of border of Parque Valle, uh, who was, is widely known as uh, sort of creating the first uh, social welfare state in Latin America in the early 20th century. Um, <clears throat> so looking at this, this sort of reproduction, right, and this reuse of the same image with different captioning in the context of, again, a front page feature um, we get a sense also of how the students were consciously using this image and reusing the image to carry particular messages, right? So this time, instead of really being focused on the Sarismo, because by March 1960, that is starting to be um, sort of wane in some regards, but this time they published it um, in an edition that is looking, 
uh, to make a, a very explicit declaration against the visit of President Eisenhower and making a, a, a declaration against U.S. imperialism. Um, and it's a, issued with a joint statement from uh, students from Argentina and Uruguay, right? So part of the argument here is thinking about how this image is helping to support not only sort of making this critique about international relations and, and trying to build solidarities amongst students for thinking about their own positionality and the ways that transnational solidarity is relevant to them, but also in thinking about how are other students, their sort of Rio Platense neighbors um, in Argentina, sort of building their own solidarities in the text here. Salud. Uh, the text here, um, uh, sort of, although not an image, right, is talking about solidarity as an expression of solidarity. And so part of the framework is thinking about how this image is helping to kind of communicate that message and speak in some ways also for these Argentine students. Um, the third political cartoon before I switch very quickly to finish up with the photographs uh, is this very detailed photograph or cartoon rather um, from a, a meeting, uh, a very famous meeting in 1962 of the Organization of American States. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read my description here to make sure that I capture all the little pieces. So uh, the cartoon appeared in a special supplemental edition of Cornada in January of 1962, intentionally timed to coincide with the meeting of the Organization of American States in the Uruguayan coastal town of Punta del Este in January uh, 22nd to, to 31. Um, and it should be noted here that this is outside of the normal school session, right? So this is uh, an extra effort that's being made to... Uh, publish this newspaper um, to coincide with this international event. Uh, the cartoon featured shows representatives from Ar Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, and Colombia sitting around a table while a large, and I would argue rather grotesque, Uncle Sam squats on top, closely surrounded by representatives from Central America, uh, Puerto Rico, Paraguay, and one of Uruguay's main, mainstream newspapers, El País. Uh, but of course, not all countries pictured are at the table. Brazil and Mexico are seen standing in the foreground while Cuba and its people are held at bay with barbed wire and unable to reach the table. The headline at the top of the page reads the Federation of Uruguayan University Students ahead of the Punta del Este Conference, Re remember and represent the peoples of America. Oh, some of those captions got a little messed up. Um, and the article, the accompanying article lays out their concerns for the outcome of this meeting on countries throughout the region. We drew attention to how institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund had already done major damage to Latin American countries with agreements that were really only friendly to those in power uh, for the benefit of capitalist interests and really all at the expense of the general public. The article also expressed deep concerns about the sanctions that might be made against Cuba at this meeting following Fidel Castro's 1961 announcement that he was now allied with the Soviet Union. So although this, this is sort of the marker for when Tercerismo kind of dies, because Cuba, for those brief two years, from 59 to 61, is this idea of Tercerismo come to life. Here's this movement that is neither capitalist nor communist, and this, this is what we're talking about. This is, could be our option. And then when Cuba's hand is sort of forced, uh, in some ways, depending on your interpretation and aligns with the Soviet Union, um, they kind of uh, abandon in some ways the idea that that philosophy uh, certainly is not coming to life uh, with, with Cuba, but that they kind of uh, shift focus in another direction, because 10 years is quite a long time for them to have worked on an ideology that were, was never able in some ways to materialize. Um, but still throughout the 1960s and beyond, the FEU stood in solidarity with Cuba and against U.S. aggression. So I want to turn now, and of course, this one also, I think, carries, uh, carries some significance for thinking about picturing um, and imagining and, and caric uh, caricaturing. I'm not sure if that's a word that I just made up in English, but um, sort of what that meeting, right, this very formal political meeting that's meant to be heads of state, right, that they're sort of uh, using this imagery to to challenge that authority and also to place themselves in that conversation as part of public discourse. Um, so 
it, to sort of shift gears, and we'll go back in the timeline and then catch up real quick. Um, the Feiyu during this time period also used a number of photographs for a number of different um, uses. There are some instances where they use photographs to celebrate victories or to um, commemorate protests that they had themselves um, in Montevideo or elsewhere in Uruguay. But they also used photographs to participate in and draw attention to international issues. Um, and so in this particular centerfold from September of 1953, um, they're sort of decrying the idea that, that Francisco Franco in Spain could be an ally of democracy to help defend the free world, right? And in this, the images, um, they sh we have features of uh, sort of lots of military photos, images of book burnings, all of these things that one would sort of regularly argue are not necessarily representations of democracy. Um, it looks like the captions are a little messed up here as well, but um, uh, just the next month in October of 1953, there's also sort of a number of other references to international issues. So you have at the top, on the top left, uh, in a kind of rather blurry image of student resistance in Cuba. This is, of course, before the Cuban Revolution, uh, which is referencing all the student activism that was happening well before 59. Thank you. Um, and uh, in the bottom left, um, this image. Um, oh, that's my timer, too. Everyone's <laughs> going off. Um, uh, this image of uh, Francisco Franco and Adolf Hitler mit meeting in uh, 1940. Right, and this idea of reminding people of, of Franco's origins and ideologies and, and alliances. Um, and then the last image um, is one that became quite, quite popular uh, throughout the 1960s were images of uh, street fights. Um, this one in particular is in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, um, and showcases students and the middle class um, being attacked by police. And this was a feature that, um, and a strategy that the Feiyu used quite often in their own struggles, but also in publicizing um, international struggles of sort of using photographs as a way to resist mainstream narratives that were trying to paint students and workers and other types of protesters as the agitators, when uh, by their own accounts and you know, uh, archival documents now finally being released are confirming that many of those agitators were actually police instigators, right, by the state. Um, but this is a way of sort of the, how they used images and photographs both as a way to express solidarity but also to sort of counter some of the narratives um, that were out there. Um, so just very, very quickly since I'm out of time, uh, some of the conclusions, right, that I draw from this research are not only that the Feyu are using images as a way to sort of strategically accompany and support their text, but that they're also doing so right at the same time that this technology is sort of expanding um, in other mediums and in other places around the world. Um, but that there's some interesting connections that I, I haven't yet had time to really dig into of whether or not how explicit um, their choices were in terms of using images for like every time they're talking about the city small, right? These are the ones that really stood out. Um, they generally tended to try to highlight examples of cases that they were trying to support or fight against as a way to support their thesis of the city small. Um, and there weren't that many sort of declarations necessarily um, of that particular platform. Um, but I'm interested in looking into sort of doing, this is a, kind of a lot even just to try to talk about in this short time, um, but in looking into more of the ways that they use the images. I'm not sure of who the authors are of any of those political cartoons, so that's something that I've looked into in some of the leftist publications and haven't been able to find uh, any answers on. So if anybody here or on the internet knows, I would be very interested. Um, but also sort of thinking about pushing into the 1960s. So a lot of my work focuses on the 1940s and 50s, um, both because there's a lot of really exciting, interesting transnational solidarity activism that these students are involved in that don't get a lot of attention, 
um, but also because I think it tells us a lot about what happens later in the 1960s. Um, and then, of course, they do continue, though they themselves face uh, repression into the late 1960s and into the 70s. Um, and this is just, it's not really part of my presentation, except for um, it's a very cool image that is from, uh, that's the front of the university. It's from 1972, so you can see that they maintain this same platform that they were expressing in the 1930s. <laughs> Um, through the, through uh, the 1970s, and the image on the top, the reason that it looks like mm -hmm. some surrealist wave um, is because these are images that were sealed and hidden in the, the roof um, of a building right before the dictatorship uh, sort of fully came to power in 1973, and they were discovered uh, decades later. And so this is, they were actually remarkably preserved, but there was some damage, but it, I think there's well, you, all you visual culture people in the room can probably do some very interesting analysis here of what this represents. But um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Megan. I think you brought some questions very interesting. For example, the, 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 the case of uh, student movements uh, as an uh, important uh, class that develops in that time and de in the especially in the 1968 but your talk show very well how actually the this actually started before uh, with this kind of as as associations that for a long time especially uh, regarding the 1968 um, movement the in order to to erase the agency of these uh, intersectional fights and battles. Uh, so we, the, 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 the historiography tend to study uh, student as a student issues, mm -hmm. but actually we can see how they were connected to uh, how they, they had this huge reach of questions of debates that inform their fight at home. So mm -hmm. this is very visible also in the Spanish case because during the dictatorship, it is actually at the core of the organization of a democratic student organization where a lot of the anti-fascist and internationalist fight against uh, the dictatorship and the connections with a uh, socialist project uh, mm -hmm. appear. So I think it's a very important question that you bring to here. I, I, I also was very interesting about the idea of tercerismo, which is actually a third way before the third way, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, also that connects, and this I think is important for us, for this Congress, but also for the project I told you that starts right now partisan resistance that whoops that wants to create create also the link and also see the ruptures between the the utopian uh, projects of the 30s and later on mm -hmm. so here we have the bridge uh, very well explained in, in your in your talk and also the fact i wanted to ask you about when cuba stops to be this mm -hmm. sp this specific third way and it's quite early huh? because for example for other communities is after 68 mm -hmm. um I will have some question uh, about about how Jornada uh, circulates at that time, about readership, for example. It is going beyond uh, the, the student community, and if yes, so, how so? And also, of course, I'm touched about the example of, of Spain and, and mm -hmm. this kind of vision of, the, of Franco. Uh, of course, this, this specific case appears because actually Franco is organizing the second Hispan American Biennial in Cuba, and uh, there was a huge movement of resistance through uh, by intellectuals, especially artists. And I didn't know about Uruguay and this this uh, student movement that they were actually positioned themselves very against the collaboration between uh, Spain and the dictatorship of Batista. So I mean, it's, it's very, very interesting and illuminating. And also my second question is about where these images come from. Mm -hmm. About the cartoons you said already, it was a question, but uh, the images, they don't they didn't have Google images. So I mean, mm -hmm. where did they took this so from all the journals and how they got uh, the images. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for your comments and for your questions. Um, for both the Jornada circulation and for the images, the, the photographs of where they came from, primarily the circulation was amongst the student population, mm -hmm. um, though they did have close relationships with a number of uh, workers' unions mm -hmm. in, uh, in Uruguay. Um, and that they regularly exchanged materials and went to each other's meetings, um, mm -hmm. something that's quite unique uh, in student movement uh, history, at least to date, uh, from 
the scholarship that I've read that the student worker uh, solidarities are actually quite unique in Uruguay because oftentimes they're, um, because of class differences, often not natural allies. Um, so, but in terms of international or wider circulation, uh, it's not entirely known, though part of where they get some of these images from and the photographs is from inter exchanges with other student organizations. So they, there were a number of conferences throughout uh, the first half of the 20th century um, and efforts, especially in the 1950s of the FEU to organize international, pan, Latin American, and sort of broader uh, student conferences where they were trying to bring people together and then create these sort of regular exchanges of information. And so they would send each other newspapers, uh, news updates, and a lot of what they reproduced, sometimes with, with images, sometimes without images, is here's a dispatch from students in Paraguay, or here's a dispatch from students in Spain. And they would reproduce their sort of manifestos, and so the, the images also arrived uh, in that same way as sort of things that were being sent to them and so they use their newspaper as a, as a way to disseminate and publicize those images on behalf of those other students most often, right? So that that part of the argument is that that, that action is representing a solidarity, transnational solidarity, but at the same time that it's trying to promote it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Yes, <clears throat> please. <coughs> just wanted to ask, uh, it's interesting, uh, because now I, uh, <laughs> I see more things about the backgrounds uh, of uh, the, 60s, uh, the 50s and 60s in, in Uruguay, but I was asking also about cinema. There was uh, mm. Mario Handler, uh, who studied in, uh, look, he's from Uruguay, mm -hmm. he studied after in, uh, in Prague in 1965, and yeah. he directed uh, Perhaps you saw the film, yeah. I like the students, me gustan los estudiantes. Exactly. Uh -huh. And uh, Liber Arce, uh, mm -hmm. Liber Arce, about a student uh, who was shot in, uh, in 1969. 68. And, 68. Uh, yeah. and after, there was also Hugo Olive, which is a filmmaker who uh, went in Cuba. He's, he shot a film called uh, uh, Como el Uruguay no hay. Mm -hmm. And uh, 1960, <laughs> and there was, and after he's an interesting character because after he went to uh, to Cuba where he worked with the uh, Titon, and mm. uh, he trained uh, some um, people in cinema and theater. After he went also in uh, in Venezuela where mm. he lived and he died uh, one year ago and he was uh, also a playwright. And I wanted to uh, to tell yes about to ask about this connection between the Cinemateca del Tercer Mundo, which is also a product of uh, this uh, tercerism. Yes, absolutely. Can I hold? Yeah, I think it would be more effective if, well, if we can take some questions sure. and you answer just. Sure. OK? Thank you. Just hold on. Sure. Sorry, that's yeah. fine. OK, well, I, I, I have a comment and a question. OK. So the, uh, the comment had to do more with the, with the issue about how, I think, that the relationship between Cuba and, and the Soviet Union and, uh, and the alliance of Cuba with the Soviet Union needs to be problematized. I think it's mm -hmm. quite a schematic to conclude that after 61, mm -hmm. uh, Cuba passed to the side of the Soviet Union because it's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, right. After 61, what happens is that uh, after the, actually during Pigs Bay invasion, right. Cuba declares itself socialist. Mm -hmm. And it finds uh, help in the Soviet Union as, as it finds help in China and sure. in other countries, right. also in the West Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. uh, but Cuba never uh, cuts its connection to the non-aligned movement with, and never lose its connection to the Third Worldist movement. Mm -hmm. And it's only after the crisis with China and I mean, you have, for instance, the right. declaration of Che Guevara in 65 in Algiers, mm -hmm. criticizing Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, and many more. It's only after the crisis with China that, in 68, it makes a, a closest alliance with the Soviet Union, which is still very problematic, mm -hmm. and still Cuba continues doing a lot of policies in terms of international affairs, 
that go against uh, the policies of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. like in Angola, Algiers, Nicaragua, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more complex than that. Sure. And and uh, it's only when you know it it you know it gets it needs a, a, a deepest historicizing way to approach that. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to ask you about this tercerismo, mm -hmm. about whether you have, uh, whether there's any explicit, or you have done any research about the link between this tercerismo and third way and Peronism, because huh. actually, yeah. it's uh, not. <laughs> Peron is talking about the third way yeah. in, in 46. Yeah. And of course, how, how it's reacting, uh, Feu, how it's reacting to the third world movement after Bandung and uh -huh. the, the non-aligned movement and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. So I'll start with the first question and actually in some ways both of the, the last part of your question also sort of pushes into the 19, later into the 1960s and that's generally kind of the part that that I don't study, <laughs> um, partially because I'm interested in looking at what happens before. Though Mario Handler, of course, and Liberarse, I mean, that would be another great image. That, that image and, and uh, Liberarse's uh, sort of face and the stencil of him still appears in Uruguay everywhere, right? So if you want to talk about uh, the power of imagery and emotional response, because um, that was Uruguay's 68. Right, that he was killed by police and it produced massive protests by students and uh, general citizens. Um, so, and I spoke with Mario Hendler when I was doing my research, but he was more interested in the 1960s. So the, the kind of my research is related, but um, in some ways also in 68, the sort of more radical student activists were really the high school students, not the university students in Uruguay. I think that was the case in lots of places. Um, but I do think that there are some interesting places to explore in thinking about what were some of the roots of theater and, and film in the 1950s that then are in conversation with the 1960s. So um, since I often get so many questions about the 1960s, I think you'll have to consider <laughs> including it into my project, um, at least as a epilogue or a larger final chapter. Um, and to your comments, so that would go along with those same comments about the Third World Movement, the Bangdung Conference, Part of the argument is that they are thinking about a third way before the non-aligned movement, but they're also thinking about it from a citizen perspective, right? That it's not a state policy in the same way that non -aligned, the non-aligned movement is, um, and it certainly precedes it by a decade. Um, and they're not, the students are not alone in this. This is m part of a much larger conversation on, on the left in Uruguay. Um, and they're also not alone in deciding around 61 that whether or not, right, the argument is not that Cuba becomes so clearly and definitively aligned with the Soviet Union, right? So obviously it's very complicated and that, that there's not sort of, even on behalf of the students and other folks in the Tessalismo movement are not necessarily saying, well, now he's done, forget Cuba, they're just part of the Soviet Union, but they do have this sort of philosophical conflict of saying, but if our movement is about anti-communism, then we can't continue with that platform and support Cuba. And so what they decide to do is to continue to support Cuba and sort of abandon the third way as like the main medium for thinking about revolution and change. So I don't know if that sort of exactly addresses, like of course it's much more complicated. The, the implication was not that they make this clear shift and that they've decided throw them out with the bathwater, but that they've said, well maybe this this, the way that we've imagined the platform, maybe that needs to evolve, or, and part of it, you could argue, is maybe then that it sort of finds a, a home in the non-aligned movement and third worldism, right? Um, but they don't explicitly state that as much in their, in their newspaper. But thank you for your comments and your questions. Okay, thank you, Megan. So we move on, but thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.
and we invite Laura. So I think that we will have uh, tomorrow one hour at the end, especially to bring all these questions unresolved and to have time to discuss together. So well, even if it's a little bit frustrating because we would like to have more time to, to questions, we have coffee breaks and also we have a specific, uh, and also we are in this kind of retire, <laughs> two days retirement, so I mean, I hope we will have time to, to address Isn't everything. So, uh, yeah, a bit uh, yeah, yeah. And so I'm going to present uh, the last speaker of the morning. Uh, she's uh, Laura Ramirez Palacios, she's coming from the um, uh, Autonoma University in Spain. Uh, she's PhD candidate in artistic, literary, and cultural studies by the Autonoma University. And uh, she has uh, worked on international academic research projects about the history of modern and, and contemporary, modern and contemporary art in Latin America. She grew a uh, broad experience on cultural events, uh, management, such as uh, exhibition, publications, and conference. Um, her academic research and plastic creation are focused on the representation of childhood and its implication in the political and social spheres. And the title of the paper is uh, Visual Rever Reverberations, Mapping Solida Solidarity Networks with Nicaragua and El Salvador in the 80s. So, it's your turn. Okay. Se escucha? Hello. Yes. Uh, well, in the first place, I want to thank Paula and Fabiola and all the organizers for accepting the paper and for the wonderful uh, coordination and hospitality. It is a honor to make, to make part of this um, event. Uh, yeah. uh, well, my doctoral research uh, is still in progress and aims to identify uh, and analyze uh, imageries of childhood generated from and for the revolutionary processes in El Salvador and Nicaragua throughout the 1980s. The project is focused on visual artifacts that were used for solidarity and propagandistic interests in the international sphere. Uh, and one of the main difficulties this research faces is that the material of study is spread around the world that is not necessarily in well-organized archives. Uh, and for this purpose, I have searched archives already in Cuba, El Salvador, Mexico, Holland, Italy, Spain, Germany, Sweden, and Switzerland, including doc documentation gathered and produced by filmmakers, historical memory centers, uh, solidarity committees, and international solidarity organizations. In this paper, I will focus on the imageries that the figure of the child soldier ar arose. I will analyze a diverse sample of documentation, including posters, magazines, photographs, films, postcards, and so solidarity bulletins, highlighting echoes that, certainly, that certain images had in different media times and latitudes. Using repetition, appropriation, and even <coughs> a resignification as traces, I will draw possible cartographies of the networks that were generated for the support of the anti-imperialist a communist, uh, anti-communist and socialist access uh, under the Cold War's uh, umbrella. In this case, I, as, as I was saying, um, it's important, uh, well, that I'm focusing only in the context of Nicaragua and El Salvador. Uh, here, in the first place, I would like to sketch very briefly uh, some of the points I understand made possible the consolidation and exploitation of child soldier imageries in, in regard of Central America's conflicts. I will point out some revolutionary iconic elements, uh, sorry, iconographic elements that ha had a significant relevance for this imagery. And also I will point out some of the communication vessels that reinforce imagery Im images picturing child soldiers as powerful weapons for solidarity. Um, in this line, I understand the Cuban Revolution and its legacies had a central, was a central pillar that must be seen with attention. After the fall of the dictator Batista in, 1960, in 1959, Cuba became a node that motivated the consolidation and strengthening of international networks. From the beginning of the 1960s, the revolutionary government developed a strong di diplomatic gear, uh, claiming solidarity as its base principle, which was understood as a 
as a tool to forge alliances in a political dimension and in order to impulse international projects for a better future. This would be somehow one of the possible definitions for solidarity in, in the case uh, of Cuba. These networks and imageries were important legacies for other revolutionary contexts in the global south. Cuba became a bridge or bond in most of the conflicts framed within the Cold, Cold War tensions, and revolutionary forces in Vietnam, Korea, Angola, Oman, Iraq, Nicaragua, El Salvador, or Guatemala took the most of the communicational apparatus the island created in order to broadcast their realities, <coughs> claim solidarity, empathy, which I believe is a very important concept within this conference, actually, <laughs> and military support. Uh, here are just some of the examples of the institutions and um, uh, events that were very important in the consolidation of these um, uh, apparatus that Cuba created. <coughs> Furthermore, Cuba's figures and events became important references that shaped, refer uh, that shaped uh, a revolutionary visual identity beyond the borders the images of Ernesto Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, to name an example, military dressed with a beret in a confident posture, holding a tobacco, in, intra, in, interacting with the community, or presenting speeches to multitudes, shaped an imagery of a revolutionary le leader that had echoes worldwide. In the case of Central America, even though the images of the revolutionaries gave continuity to the visual models imparted by the uh, Cuban context, <coughs> they also promoted and poured clandestine and official media visual strategies in order to forge their own identity. <laughs> Sorry, I lost it. Um, okay, uh, in the case of Central America, even though the images of the revolutionaries gave continuity to visual models imparted by the Cuban co context, they also promoted and pure appeared uh, in clandestine and official media visual strategies uh, in order to forge their own identity. One of the points uh, that both the Sandinista and the guerrillas of El Salvador promoted was the exaltation of women and children as, an active, as active actors in the revolutionary programs, not only as supporters, but as combat soldiers. Furthermore, women and children, even though were subaltern groups in their societies, ended up embodying a significant part of the propaganda images and statements of, the, of these here. Slogans as, and I quote, the revolutionary will be, the revolution will be feminist or it will not be, or the revolutionary, the revolution is done with the family, were frequently used in and outside the countries. Statements that of course were supported by a broad spectrum of visual and cultural productions. In the case of Nicaragua, along the confrontation against Anastasio Somoza's dictatorship in the years previous to the insurrection of 1979, the imagery of the guerrillero shaped by the Cuban revolution previously mentioned was extended to female figures who had an outstanding or privileged status on the country and the insurgency. This can be seen in the pictures of personalities as Violeta Chamorro, Joconda Belli, or Nora Stonga, as is shown here. And it is interesting to see uh, some of the iconographic codes present in the portraits of, th that they show some of the iconographic uh, codes of the portraits of Fidel Castro and El Che while being in the Sierra Maestra uh, were replicated. Uh, once again, we see the dressing, the beret, the posture, and even the facial expressions now. <coughs> Eventually, other women uh, who fought in the Sandinistas armed forces, not necessarily known in the public sphere, became a subject of interest for the photojournalists who traveled to the country. In an, inter in an interview I did to the Mexican photojournalist Pedro, Pedro Altierra, he highlighted that one of the things that surprised him the most uh, was the significant participation women had in the armed forces. Uh, many of them were picturing the role 
as fighters, but soon later they were also highlighted as, as mothers, and this became one, one more element that astonished the international community especially after the picture of the Nicaraguan photogra photographer Orlando Valenzuela, uh, which became one of the most iconic images of the Sandinista revolution, internationally known as the Miliciana of Guasualito. This young woman with a bright smile holding an AK-47 in her shoulder while breastfeeding a baby in a public act became a symbol of, of hope and future that mobilized solidarity groups all over the world. And here we can see some of the appropriations the image, the image had in Mexico, uh, Brazil, and the United States. Sorry. These same tragedies was replicated by the guerrilla of El Salvador in the images that produced themselves, emphasizing both mother and fatherhood as, elem as elements that humanize the combatants and as a metaphor for hope, future, and peace. In this case, we can see some of the images that were exported by the guerrilla through clandestine channels. In the left, we can see the picture as it, is, as it arrived to the Solidarity Committee of Sweden. Nevertheless, the committee never reproduced the image in the, bullets, in the bulletins they, they published themselves. And instead, they used to include pictures of combatants training in the liberated areas and dead bodies, among other traces of repression and human rights violations. Boys and girls not only became a figure to highlight the humanity of adult com combatants, but they also became an active subject and voice within their, these contexts. They appeared in interviews, videos, reports, informing, <coughs> informing about the human rights violations they witnessed. Uh, they broadcasted the urgency and need their communities had to steer up. And finally, more or less from seven years old and over, they became a face for the revolution, picturing in, uh, pictured in their roles as clandestine messengers, known as correitos, and as combatants. Uh, but at this point, the model of the revolutionary, <coughs> an adult revolutionary, merged with the romantic view of the child that recalls future and prosperity. However, the child was not represented, uh, represented as a passive a uh, subject, as happens in other cases of recent history, and I'm thinking here uh, about the images of children in Vietnam, but also as a desiring subject who, in this case, makes the revolution for his own satisfaction, desire, and need. Here we, uh, here we have one of the postcards that the Solidarity Committee of Turin produced to sell in different countries of Europe. In the back side, side it says, families are defending the FMLN, Frente Faraundo Martí para la Liberación Nacional, control zones. Uh, the union of the society, the revolution, <coughs> uh, as a family project suddenly became an idea of worldwide diffusion, especially while referring to El Salvador. It is important to remember that 40, uh, 40 years ago, child recruitment, recruitment, sorry, that's a word that, <laughs> uh, it's difficult, um, mm, didn't have the negative connotations as in the present. The participation of the child soldier in the armed battles was a practice that was fu fully normalized until 1989 with the unanimous approval of the Convention of the Rights of the Child in the uh, United Nations, and this was the first treaty that, state, that stated a minimum age for children to, to participate in, in war, initially 15 years and eventually 18 years old. Uh, in an intent to understand the specificities of the international imageries that involve child soldiers in Nicaragua and El Salvador, I have identified visual rever reverberations, echoes, appropriations, and dislocations in different contexts that allowed me to trace some of the international solidarity channels of communication. And <laughs> out, of, out of it, we can see some of the agreements and disagreements in, in between solidarity groups towards the statements uh, the subversive groups were proposing. Moreover, an analysis on the ways these images were reproduced, resignified, or criticized where they note, uh, may denote some of the complexities within the networks that made possible their circulation. Uh, just to, to contextualize you, the FMLN in, in El Salvador was constituted uh, by 
uh, five different um, <coughs> left-wing organizations, three of them were armed, uh, and since minus, um, 1980, uh, with the assassination of Oscar uh, um, Monseñor Romero, uh, they decided to unify and uh, also unify their uh, communica uh, communication apparatus. Um, that just like to give you a, an idea. After interviewing actors of the guerrilla, photojournalists, and other scholars that address the civil war of El Salvador, it can be seen that Mexico, Nicaragua, and, and Cuba were the main nodes that made possible the production and international transmission of an important part of the images produced by the guerrillas of El Salvador. The first case of study that I would like to highlight makes reference to a 13-year-old uh, guerrilla fighter uh, of Salvador known as Patango. Patango is a colloquial expression to refer a chubby boy in El Salvador. Patango first appeared in the short film titled Morazan, which was produced by the artistic group Cero a la Izquierda as part of the propagandistic initiatives of the ERP, Ejército Revolucionario del Pueblo, which was one of the organizations that eventually made part of the FMLN in 1980, before the, the consolidation of, of, of the FMLN. Um, uh, it was directed by Guillermo Scalón and Manuel Sorto, and the film presents songs liberated by the guerrilla in Morazan, uh, and Patango is the only person interviewed explaining the situation the guerrilla was living, why they were armed, and why they had to struggle. The post-production was started in Mexico, but finished and distributed by Cuban institutions. After passing through Mexico, uh, still pictures of Patango uh, developed during the shooting of the film <coughs> were appropriated by the Mexican Solidarity Committee with the Salvadorian peoples, as it can be seen in these two posters. <coughs> uh, these were the first echoes the image of Patango had. Um, the same image on the poster eventually had other echoes on the international bulletin Venceremos of the FMLN, a bulletin that was coordinating in between Mexico and Spain actors working with the FMLN. By the first time, Patango became the face of the FMLN and not only as part of the ERP, um, which is also something important to highlight. And as I said, the bulletin was coordinated between Mexico and Spain, but it was printed exclusively in Spain. And even so, we can suppose it had a distribution throughout Europe, since we can find the bulletins today in other countries, as it happens in this example, which I found it in Holland. In Amsterdam, yes. Mm -hmm. The short film was also presented in the Festival Internacional de Nuevo Cine Latinoamericano and was reviewed for international publications, the festival motivated. One example is this book, Le Cinema de l'Amérique Latine, sorry for my French, <laughs> that was published in 1981. Uh, and also the special edition of the Triconintinental magazine, Cinema Acción, uh, published in 1982. In both publications, it is important to highlight that the image selected to present the film and to make reference to all the Salvador and subversive movies productions was a still of the movie where Patango appears with a rifle hanging in his shoulder. Both publications were printed in, in Paris, and actually the second one uh, advertised the previous one. Also in 1981, a drawing based on this same image of Patango was included in the Tricontinental magazine number 76 with a cartoon balloon saying revolution. The drawing accompanied a transcription uh, of a speech that the Salvadorian fighter Norma Guevara presented in the anti-imperialist scientific conference held in Berlin in 1980. It is interesting to remark that no images of Guevara were included in the text, with the text, and Patango was the only face in the article without a mask. In this line, we can say the face of Patango embodied Guevara's discourse. 
he became the face that pointed out the revolutionary need and the international implications the Salvadorian conflict represented. Since the text emphasized on the military training, the economic funding the United States and the economic uh, funding the United States was providing to oppressive forces in El Salvador. The drawing was designed, <coughs> was signed, sorry, here. Uh, no. Okay, here in the bottom, uh, there's a signature of Rafael Morente, who was one of the designers of the OSPAL. Uh, and according to Rafael Enriquez, the only one, uh, the only designer that still works for the OSPAL, Morante did the drawing based on the picture which was sent by the guerrillas to the magazine. Even though I didn't find the original pictures of Patango in the folders that still remain in the OSPAL, I did confirm that the guerrillas commonly sent photographs to the organization. And here I have an example of other image uh, where we can see the stamp of the, in the back of the, of the picture of Radio Venceremos, which was one of the main press agencies of the FMLN. And also uh, they sent other images of armed children in different moments. <coughs> <coughs> Later, in 1985, the Tricontinental Magazine number 98 included other photographs of Patango in commemoration of the settlement of the FDR, Frente Democrático Revolucionario, which was the first intent of the FMLN to reach the political power by democratic means. The same image was used in posters produced by solidarity committees in Holland and Germany <laughs> request, requesting aid for El Salvador. Although we don't know precise information about the distribution this photograph had, and we have no references about the authors or dates of these appropriations, the languages used and the places where the images were found, which are not always necessarily the place of the production, denoted a broad circulation and interest in the image. <coughs> I find it very suggestive to say, to say it somehow, uh, that committees in Holland and Germany did not appro appropriate images of Patando holding the rifle, which we already saw they received, but they appropriated this other picture, which is certainly more subtle in the, as the kid is not holding the rifle in his arm, but placing it in the floor, and that is not in the jungle, but in a place with work tools. While using this image, we could think the committees uh, in Holland and Germany didn't disapprove child mil militarization. This instead might show us that uh, were more identified with a demo democratic and not an armed solution for the violent situation in Salvador, that the Salvador was living. We could argue there was a different position between the left solidarity movements in some parts of Europe in contrast, for example, to Cuba. As we can see in the same tricontinental tri magazine where the image of Patango was published, Child soldiers were not an exclusive resource for El Salvador revolutionary ideals, and other children <coughs> gave face uh, to struggles and liberation uh, uh, of colonies, as is the case of Zimbabwe, just to present that, one of the many others. Uh, also, Patango was not the only child soldier used to make reference to the Central American context, but there were other images in the same line under, even until 1984, published in the Cuban magazine. And this uh, is an example of it. <coughs> and, well, uh, very briefly, uh, the second case study I would like to mention, just as a counterexample, uh, is the documentary Ballad of the Little Soldier of 1984, produced by the German filmmaker Bernard Herzog and the French reporter Dennis Reichler. Uh, the movie presents indigenous child soldiers that fought with the counterinsurgency counter of Nicaragua in the Contra War throughout the 1980s in the border between Honduras and Nicaragua. The information gathered about the actors, institutions, and communication channels involved in the distribution of this film is not fully detailed, but I have found documentation that demonstrates it was screened in television and movie theaters in England 
the United States, Germany, Nicaragua, along other places of Latin America. Uh, while filming the Battle of the Little Soldier, <coughs> Herzog and Reichle intended to criticize the presence of part and participation of, chi of children in war. Nevertheless, the movie was intentionally understood, uh, internationally understood, as a disapproval of Sandinista's policies. Uh, in a famous in interview with Herzog, Paul Cronin classifies the movie as the most political film uh, of the director, and Herzog replies to him, may I correct you? This is a quote. May I correct you? It's about children who are fighting in a war, not a film about the Sandinistas or, or Somoza. It was filmed in Nicaragua, the demo uh, since it was filmed in Nicaragua, the do dogmatic left, for whom the Sandinistas at that, at that time were still the sacred cow, could not accept that I was not working alongside the CIA on this project, but the film is not political. It does not matter what political content there is when you have a nine-year-old fighting in a war. Herzog emphasized that the film did not respond to a political position, but was a social concern uh, in relation to the mindset that defended the incorporation of children in the armed co conflicts at the time. The director's intent in interest focused on what Herzog himself called the human element of the story. And he even argued it could have been filmed in any other country where the child requirement occurred. Nevertheless, the critics <laughs> almost done. <laughs> Nevertheless, the critics virtually unnoticed the statement on child recruitment, dis dislocating the debate towards the political ground. And the main contro controversy um, documented in, in this um, review of Film Quarterly um, uh, referred to the testimonies included in the film in which Mosquito men, women, and children assured the Sandinista forces displaced their communities through violent means. Uh, as he describes it in this article, both sides of the debate ended inserted in slanderous tactics where Herzog and Reichler were, were accused of being sponsored by the CIA for the production of the film. Uh, and the main uh, personalities that critiqued uh, the movie were even indicated as spies of the Sandinistas in the United States. Mm. Um, what makes me what makes me not understand <laughs> what happened in this case uh, is that there were also scenes in which the al adults argued the militarization of children was a fundamental part of the conflict and even accept they were brainwashing them uh, so they could go with no fear to fight and they actually used the word brainwash <coughs> uh -huh. This was uh, one of the cases in one of the uh, the movies that accompanied the the documentary of Herzog in England, but I'm skipping that. Uh, Certainly by this time, the participation of children in war context had a completely different meaning. Additionally, it was a reality of both right and left wings movements. And ultimately, we could say that Herzog and Rachel's intention to present, denounce, question, question and reconsider children recruitment was eclipsed in the other express, uh, in, the, in the opinion expressed through the media by the political arena. To conclude, the circulation of the image of Patango and the contradictory reception of the movie, of the movie Ballad of the Little Soldier provides strong evidence on, completely, on how completely far it was the perception about child uh, soldiers 40 years ago. Child soldiers not only were a reality, but were understood as a political correct figure, even to forge solidarity ties. <coughs> At the end point, one of the main questions I would like to put on the table uh, would be, is solidarity exclusively a contribution to others' causes, or it can be seen also as a strategy in order to build the, the identity of whoever is being solidarity? 
I mean, the appropriation of images denotes a projection and as such, a self-definition through an other in, in capital letters. Uh, and this would explain the dislocations, exclusions, or resignifications of some images in different contexts. Solidarity networks do not seem to weave in a plain horizontal ground, ground but in a complex multi-layered multi scenario. <coughs> Solidarity with left-wing organizations were very diverse. They were anarchist, socialist, internationalist, or communist who supported the need of weapons for liberation, but they also were pacifists um, who sought to make visible the contradictions of war and military practices as occurs somehow with the film of Herzog and, and Reich. And that would be all. Thank you. Uh, so thank you a lot for the presentation, uh, Laura. Uh, I think it's very interesting to um, uh, make a reflection about the resignification of the imagery of the revolution in a time that is a kind of uh, threshold between the end of the Cold War and the beginning of other uh, ways uh, to understand the guerrilla, like, for example, the Zapatistas and so on. And I think it's very interesting, for example, the way in which you describe uh, the uh, resignification of uh, uh, the images of, uh, for example, uh, the, the woman in the guerrilla with uh, this kind of uh, humanization of the, of the uh, soldiers and so on. Um, and also it's very interesting the description of the transits of the images, for example, the meaning that they acquire in di different contexts is not the same in uh, uh, North in, in Europe that uh, in, for example, uh, um, uh, Cuba or Nicaragua and so on. And uh, I think that uh, this is a very uh, interesting introduction to the f uh, final part of your presentation about the Herzog's films because there the, the question is very clear. Um, and uh, I, I would like to, uh, to uh, know something more about how do you think this kind of uh, mm, specific context of the imaginaries of revolution at the end of the El El Cold War from the point of view of the Nicaraguan and El Salvador uh, cases. <coughs> yeah, because I think that uh, in, in some way it's a kind of uh, uh, reinforce, reinforcements of uh, the uh, imaginaries of the uh, revolution from the, uh, for example, from the Cuban case. But at the same time, I think that with this uh, point of view of the uh, childhood uh, and also from the point of view of the motherhood and the fatherhood, mm -hmm. uh, there is a kind of resignification of the guerrilla, but it's, dif it's difficult for me to think the, um, the link with uh, uh, the 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 resignification that, for example, appears with the uh, Zapatistas because it's uh, a kind of completely different universe. I think so. Yeah. Well, um, what I've seen, but well, it's very difficult because every time I'm finding new material and. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what <coughs> I think is that uh, since in 1989 the child, uh, the Convention of the Children's Rights was uh, signed, uh, there was a completely important shift uh, that somehow killed these kind of images because people really felt like it was wrong to sh show them. No? They, they were no longer politically correct. Uh, so somehow this imagery like fade. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, well, there are still some like the Islamic group uh, the, um, are, are using it uh, still nowadays, but these are very rare <laughs> examples. Uh, and the other thing that I have recently found is that child uh, soldiers within the images of, of revolution and father and motherhood was also very important in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And this is something I've just like found and I, I don't have further information. There were even books that, that were published uh, in relation to Iran 
uh, where um, there was like a, this exaltation of the of the children and re uh, and the religion, uh, like in a religious like a uh, reading of their um, involvement with the political uh, scenario. So I believe it was not only a, 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 a something that happened in, 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 in Central America, but it did happen in other places that mm -hmm. I'm not completely, uh, well, I, I, I have just found that they existed, so I don't have further information on how mm -hmm. different or similar or mm -hmm. they were. So we have uh, 10 minutes for questions. <coughs> Um, we think that it would be better to gather the different questions uh, and after that uh, you... Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's just, this is just a, an open question. You don't have to answer precisely on, on, on that example, but if you have some thoughts, I'd, li I'd like to hear them. Um, since you're talking about reverberations um, and you've just made links with the Middle East, um, I was wondering whether we could draw some parallels between the emphasis on the um, participation, of participation of women, uh, female figures in the Sandinista uh, revolution, and what's happening now in the Kurdish um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 movement, uh. Yeah. with a strong emphasis on uh, the participation of women and also a conscious strategy to put beautiful women, according to Western mm. standards, in front of the camera to speak about the revolution. just <coughs> add a, sh a, s a small comment because you're talking about the 80s but when I'm looking at the map this is the map after 1995 because I see where there was Yugoslavia in the 80s uh, now sorry, you have yes. all these republics mm -hmm. and also with Czech it's and today's it's, it's, yeah. today's it's today's map, today's so map yes a short observation <laughs> <laughs> um, well thank you very much I have a my question is not really central to your work, but I, I was wondering about the contacts, because you, you, you told us about the committees, and uh, well, I, I will be talking about Chile this afternoon, and there were also solidarity committees, uh, I mean, worrying uh, about the Chile situation and the dictatorship, and I was wondering if there were contacts between them, because in fact, they were all speaking about solidarity, but the, the, mm -hmm. the, the links with the, with the different scenes were, in fact, um, implicating very different ideas of solidarity or very different political convictions as well. So I just wanted, uh, since you went to Sweden and uh, you're exploring mm -hmm. also, I mean, some archives over there, I mean, well, what do you Precisely. think about it? I have I have ah, okay. ah, there. Okay, so go, go, and then I will finish myself. I am a very we don't okay. you have to yes. I am a very short person for you. You focus on some case in particular, such as Petango. And I would like to know whether there is a clear consciousness of using uh, children uh, images as a emphatic tool. I mean uh, why Fatango? Okay. Do you Anita, you have to speak a little bit louder because yeah, it's like a, okay. <laughs> a whisper, <laughs> if not. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up on what I said earlier and say maybe something you kind of highlighted was a paradigm shift. And this is something images can foreground much, much better than words. So mm -hmm. you, you immediately realize that, that there's been a paradigm shift in the way in which we look at children, right? And weapons, of course. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something you know we might look at today and tomorrow, how images can highlight you know, political shifts, uh, moral shifts. And I think mm -hmm. this is very interesting, something images really can you know, uh, do much, much better than words, I think, even political words. So my last comment, because... Uh, there is another Might I connect to this? Just like, what, 
If not, yes. Uh, no, go, go. So the idea is, and I think this should be emphasized because I think your paper was really important. You have all these images, and it's really clear, you know, that it was an important issue. But what is at stake if you don't emphasize it uh, that much? And what has to be traced, I think, really, is this uh, this shift of understanding child social, not just like in the institutional way, but also to grasp really, I, I would argue maybe there are also some kind of nuances. You pointed it out. The use maybe, and this should be also worked out, I think the use within the Latin American context, the use of uh, images of child soldiers in the European context, and for example, today we have this kind of connotation, it's something bad, but there's still kind of just like publics where children are still used in the Intifada, is still something that is in the Palestinian context, it's still something that's used in the Northern Ireland conflict, it was also after the uh, 89 something, it was used. Today, we in the Western world, the last time we've spoken, I think, publicly about child soldiers was in, in 2012 with a huge Coney campaign on the internet. I think it is really important to contextualize this and to trace also, not to generalize, but to go deeper into the analysis and to find out what are actually the different kind of levels of nuances and who is the public that it was addressing to because it seems like when Herzog made his just like film there was the shift at the end yeah. of the Cold War in this period and then actually just like like the Academia Real uh, uh, Española just like something happened the shift happened and then uh, UN said okay right now we ban child soldiers mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to, to, on the one hand, okay, you can see what was happening, but also to try to trace these kind of shifts and base it uh, on a kind of theoretical ground a little bit more. But very good, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Just to finish, regarding the Kurdish, in Documenta there was a film, and you could see like women were really important in the guerrilla and also children too. Uh, we saw that. And the other thing is, I actually, one day I was looking because I like very much the song Hasta Siempre Comandante, <laughs> you know, which one it is. Um, Comandante Che Guevara. <laughs> so I was looking around for, for a version, and actually, a French singer, Nathalie Cardon, I don't know if you know her. I didn't know her. She did this video in which she plays in 1999. <laughs> she plays all these roles as the women, as a soldier with the child, giving the milk and uh, breastfeeding. And I was like, really, oh my God, this is outdated. When is, was that? And actually, it was 1999. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's interesting that how it permeates in, in mm -hmm. pop culture too. Mm -hmm. So please, Laura, you have to mm -hmm. make us think a lot. So please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I'm aware that in this case I'm just presenting a little small part of my research, but uh, I have to say I've been studying not only child soldier imageries, but for example vict child victims and how all these imageries were like um, uh, creating like cert uh, minds, certain mi mindsets and how, uh, and this is very important that I believe answers some of the questions, uh, how was the difference between reality and representation? Because it's not that, well, child soldiers is still occur all over the world. And well, in, in my country, Colombia, there are a lot of, 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 of child soldiers. But the use of the images of child soldiers as a weapon almost, uh, as a visual weapon, it's something that I, I believe was completely changed, uh, more or less around the 80s. I believe this is the, the period, uh, this decade is a, is a decade where all these uh, subjects were reconsidered uh, due to the importance uh, human rights and the uh, child soldiers, uh, child, children's rights uh, had worldwide. And actually the convention of, of, the, of the children's rights of the UN uh, it's the only convention of all history that was uh, signed by all the countries. Uh, the only country that never like uh, ratificar, how do you say? Uh, ratified uh, the uh, the convention was the United States, which of course, <laughs> which is quite <laughs> yeah, uh, something to to show. Um, so yes, there's a difference between uh, what actually is happening in a place uh, and the fact that these images beco becomes uh, propaganda and, and something to motivate um, 
solidarity um, about uh, solidarity committees uh, you ask me <laughs> well actually uh, the case of the solidarity committee in Sweden it's very interesting because it used to be the solidarity committee for Chile uh, so when they realized that the situation in Chile was not changing in a short term and <laughs> There, there were already a couple of, like, I, I believe a decade already, they were working on it. And Central America became very important within the media. Uh, they also included within the committee the interest on, on Central America. So they were completely connected. But still, I, I have to, to underline what I said at the, at, at the last of the, at the final part of the presentation. There were very different uh, persons, uh, like uh, ideologies within this committee. So uh, this created like very tense situations, and they not always like agreed on the images and the policies, and uh, they were looking for to help or aid other co uh, territories and. Um, why Patango? That's also a very interesting question because uh, that's, I, I believe that's what I, I've asked all the people I've interviewed and everyone seems like it's, it's like, I believe they are like frightened or ashamed that they used a child to make part of the, of the, of the, of the propaganda. So it's very difficult to to actually work with interviews in this research because since the gap or the the shift or on on the way we see child soldiers today is so big uh, that that they can't see it from a historical perspective they that can they can't like um, place again on how were they were thinking at that moment so that's also like one of the main difficulties I'm, I'm, I I've had so far um, and about the Kurdish, uh, well, uh, it's also what I was talking about, um, demographic, like the demographic influence uh, or impact on the images. Um, well, there were a lot of children with in, in Central America's images because they were half of the population also so for example um when i asked some of the photojournalists i've interviewed uh, so you were particularly interested on children while picturing uh, the, the situation in these countries and they sometimes told me no they just were there <laughs> <laughs> no? so i think it's the same thing well happens something very similar uh, in kurdistan and uh, the, and it's the fact that it's it's a demographic like um, uh, issue, issue no, and like fact. yeah, a fact that that it's reflected through images as well, no? Mm. So, so thank you so much, uh, Laura. We have now like uh, 50 minutes for lunch, and it's important to be here on time to thank start you. the. Yeah, thank you very much. See you later. Okay, so we are going downstairs. <laughs>